All right, good afternoon. Uh, today, it's August 28th, 2018. This is our first stakeholder meeting for the full day kindergarten facilities grant program. A little housekeeping before we get started. Um, there's two exit doors in the back of the room, two on the sides if we need to leave. Um, if there's a fire drill, go out to the river walk on the back patio and just hang out there until the all clear is given. Uh, the bathrooms are out the back doors and to your left. There's also vending machines around the corner down the long hallway. Um, as a reminder, this meeting is being webcast and transcribed. If you have a question, please hold off for a minute. Uh, Lisa Jones or someone from OPSC will run a mic over to you um, before we answer those. And Brian and I will try to repeat it if we can. Uh, from a meeting standpoint, Brian and I are going to walk through the concepts of OPSC's interpretation, kind of our proposal for running the program. Um, if a concept's not clear as we're walking through it, feel free to ask a question at that point. But we'll try to save actual discussion towards the end if you want to propose other ideas for criteria or priority points or what have you. Um, we're scheduled for three hours today. If we need a break halfway, we can do that. Um, we'll just kind of play that one by ear. And then as a reminder, if, you have, if you're watching by webcast, if you have any follow-up comments that you'd like to pass on to OPSC, feel free to email Brian and I. Um, our email addresses, I believe, are on the notice, and they're also on OPSC's website. All right. Any questions before we get started today? All right. So as I mentioned, uh, we're, we're here to discuss OPS approach criteria for eligibility and funding of the full day kindergarten facilities grant program. Um, as a little bit of background for those not familiar with it, Assembly Bill 1808 added Education Code 17375 to the statutes. Um, it was signed by the governor on June 27th of 2018. And what this program does is allow school districts that lack facilities to provide full day kindergarten to apply for one time grants to either construct new classrooms or retrofit existing classrooms for the purposes of providing full day kindergarten. Um, as part of the 2018 2019 Budget Act, $100 million was provided to this program. Uh, full day kindergarten, um, these classrooms that you're building and retrofitting, uh, they must satisfy the requirements in Title V. This is, this is specified in statute that they do this. Um, specifically, uh, California Code of Regulations, Section 14030, uh, Paragraph 2 of Subdivision H. Uh, for the purpose of this program, Education Code 8973 defines full-day kindergarten as four hours of, or longer of classroom time, and that is exclusive of recess time. Uh, for your convenience, as part of the item on attachment A, we've put all the statutes added for the program. We've also put references to Title V section and the Education Code for Full Day Kindergarten. So I'm on the bottom of page one. We'll start off with how staff's interpreting this program. Um, for this purpose of this program, only school districts may apply. Um, as opposed to the school facility program where statutes expressly allow or define school districts as school districts, county offices of education, um, CDE in terms of California School for the Deaf and Blind. Um, those are not expressly stated in the statute. So we believe only school districts are allowed to apply for this program. Um, that also excludes charter school um, entities. On page two, you'll see the funding available for the program. So 100 million was allocated. Um, up to two and a half million is available for the Department of General Services to actually administer the program. Um, if you've been following vacancies, OPSC is actually in the process of hiring four staff now to run this program. Um, so hopefully those staff will be on board shortly. That leaves 97.5 million for this program. OPSC is proposing that we do, do it in two rounds. Um, this is, the start dates would be depending on how fast we can get regulations going. But assuming they can be live by January 1st, we'd first start ac accepting applications on January 2nd with the round closing on January 31st and put about a third of the million, 37.5 million for that first round. If we receive the apps in January, in theory, we'd process those apps, take them somewhere around May, June State Allocation Board meeting. Second round would overlap slightly. We'd accept applications May 1st through May 30th of 2019 and the remaining balance of 60 million would be applied there. 
uh, if we don't receive enough applications in the first round for that 37.5, we roll into the second round. Um, we'll also propose to the board that that second round have apps. We hold on to those applications for 18 months and just keep funding down the order um, to use up all the money. If at the end of two rounds we still don't have enough applications, we could consider a third round, but the idea is that all the cash has to be encumbered within three years. Uh, anybody not funded during a particular round, we will send back your applications. You are welcome to apply for a future round, though. So project criteria, the intent of the program is to increase the capacity or increase the number of kindergarten classrooms, actual kindergarten classrooms as they meet Title V um, on a school campus. It is not uh, for growth. Um, you can also retrofit existing classrooms. Let's say you, you have kids housed in a classroom that's designed for a first grader, and you need to retrofit those to add counter space or toilets for designed for a kindergarten. The retrofit aspect of the program would allow for that. Another criteria for the program is that you lack the facilities on your campus, but you have kindergarten kids there. So what we'll ask as part of the application process is that you show us what your current enrollment of kindergarten is on the campus, your current kindergarten classroom inventory, um, so we can compare those. Uh, we'll ask for a site map, kind of just showing where all those classrooms are on your campus so we can visually see it for ourselves. And for this program, we're asking for a narrative um, to make sure that you're, we're meeting the intent of the program. We want to we know what you're doing with kindergarten kids now. How many are you housing? Are you housing 50 kids, half day each, in one kindergarten classroom? Or are you housing them in a non-kindergarten classroom? And what is your proposed project? Where are you going to end up after this project's done? Uh, for the purposes of this program, I think statute references SFP will load all classrooms at 25 uh, pupils. So on the bottom page three, we kind of have an example there. In this particular case, there's a school with 100 kindergarten kids on the campus. The, this school before the project, what they're doing is they're running a half-day program, morning and afternoon, in two actual kindergarten classrooms. So in this particular case, if they wanted to run full-day kindergarten, they're short two kindergarten classrooms. So we'd fund two under this program, 50 K-6 people grants like an SFP, so that after the project, they can actually run four full-day kindergarten classrooms all day. Another option for school districts on the top of page four is to retrofit an existing classroom. So this is the example where you're there in a first grade classroom. It's not technically a kindergarten classroom. This program allows you to retrofit that classroom to make it for this purpose. Now, this program is for retrofitting. It's not for moder modernizing. You're, you're doing this project to create a kindergarten classroom. Um, you're not upgrading the other components of it. Uh, middle page four, project types. Kind of a summary of what's allowed and not allowed. So new construction, again, you're allowed to build new classrooms. Um, new schools are not allowed. Um, that's what the SFP is designed to build. Um, you can acquire, convert existing buildings into kindergarten classrooms. Uh, this per program excludes portable classrooms. You can't buy those new. Um, it must be on an existing or adjacent site. Site acquisition is allowed in this program. If you have an, uh, an existing campus, the only way you can add a kindergarten classroom and say add some acreage next to the campus, you can do that. Um, but it's for that site. And as a reminder, this new construction as well houses existing kindergarten classrooms or kindergarten students. For retrofitting, um, Another reminder, you're retrofitting a classroom, you're not modernizing it. You cannot do portable replacement. Like for like replacement is allowed in the SFP modernization program, but not in this program. You, that's a good point. You could retrofit an existing portable. Um, we're not quite sure how that worked. Perhaps you have a double wide portable and you're breaking down walls to make it a giant kindergarten. Um, the key is you still have to meet current Title V when you do that, though, when, you, the, when the project's completed. As far as district match, uh, similar to SFP, new construction projects are funded 50-50 state and district matching share. 
retrofit projects, 60% state share, 40% district share. Um, for this program, you are allowed for financial hardship funding for all or some of your match. The qualification criteria is the same as it is in the school facility program. Um, same phase one checklist we envision that you do now. Um, same documentation for determining what funding is available. Uh, middle page five, the application types. We're trying to move the money quickly. So this, like, this the application types I'm about to spell out apply regardless of whether you're a financial hardship district. Now there's two types of projects we envision right now. Those with DSA approved plans, you're ready to go, you're construction ready, and those without DSA approved plans. So on pay, bottom page five, we can have a chart to outline what the process may look like for a project with DSA approved plans. Uh, we created a new, new uh, form for, if you're familiar with SFP starting with the 50s, we're gonna start this program with a 70 for no reason whatsoever. Um, the first form, the 7001, would be your application for funding. You'd submit that in. It will be heavily reliant on self-certifications. Um, we will not request copies of DSA-approved plans, DSA-approved plan letters, or your CDE plan approval letters. Um, we will just ask for those dates. And we will work with CDE and DSA to get copies of those if we need them. But for now, you just fill in those dates. Um, some kind of declaration from the district or certification that you are you already have full day kindergarten. Um, those are those projects where you have full day kindergarten, but they're not in kindergarten facilities. Uh, the other option is, is if you plan to after the project's done. So we'd require a certification to say, after I approve this project or after this project is funded and completed, we will do full day kindergarten. Uh, the reason why we'll take that certification is we know districts would be hesitant to start moving down this path of doing a board resolution saying we're gonna offer full day kindergarten and then not be in the funding order or fundableness priority system. Um, so that way you don't get too far ahead of yourselves. Um, if you get funded and apportionment from the board, when you request your fund release, we'll ask for those certifications later or a closeout. And again, that, so that flow chart, the way it'll work, you apply for the project, we take those certifications and we'd rank them based on the priority system we'll talk back later. Um, as a reminder, this $100 million comes from the state's general fund. It is cash available. It's ready to release as soon as you ask for it, basically. So we'll give you an apportionment. And for right now, we're proposing a 100-day fund release per period to get under binding contracts for completion of the project. As soon as your project's apportioned or slightly before, we'd send you a grant agreement for the project. You would send that back to us just like you do now for the school facility program. Uh, you certify that your project is under construction or binding contracts for completion of the project, and then we'd process your fund release request. So you have, again, 180 days from apportionment to fund release. Our thought with that is from a timing standpoint of when we might take these first two rounds of the board. If the first round goes to the May, June boards, in theory, you'd be able to do construction the, uh, next summer in 2019. Um, through the next application and process, or the second round, you'd be this following summer, most likely to start construction. So timing we think will work out, um, but that's our thought process behind that one. The other type of application we are thinking, this is on top of page six, is projects without DSA approved plans. So you intend to do full day kindergarten, you don't do it now, or you have it and you wanna do a project, but you don't have the money lined up for it. So we're thinking about a multi-phase approach to releasing the funds for these. You submit your form with everything you know you plan to do. Um, we can work off of preliminary appraisals if you intend to buy site acquisition. Um, but you'd submit everything you have. Um, you don't need your DSA approval dates yet. You'll do that at fund release later on when you're ready for construction. We would rank the projects. We would score them. We'd give an apportionment at the same board we give everybody else. But you have one year to complete this process for the release of all your cash. Um, so in terms of a phase approach, you get your apportionment. As soon as you give us your grant agreement, we'll release 25% of your base amount. Uh, that way you can get started on the design of your project. We will also release 2% of your site acquisition amount, or what we call under a school facility program, your site other grant. That allows you to go pay for your appraisals, locate the site, do your preliminary testing, and, and move down that path. 
As soon as you're able to enter into escrow, move forward along with actually locating a site, you submit the final appraisals and your escrow opening documentation or closure documentations, and then we'll release your site acquisition funding to you. Continue through your design, hopefully in parallel, and work through DSA so that within one year, you're under contract for completion of the project, and then you're requesting that final release after submittal of the final grant agreement. If you don't need the site acquisition early, then we'll, at the construction phase, your final fund release, we'll just release everything all at once. Now, both of these application types, it doesn't matter if you're financial hardship or not. We'll, we'll allow both processes for both types um, of projects. Another important thing, these apportionments, once they happen, it's the money is reserved for you. We aren't gonna do a financial hardship re review at the time you do your site acquisition or the, the time you do your construction grant release. We only do it initially at the very beginning. The only thing that's gonna do a re-review though is your site acquisition um, hazardous waste cleanup costs. We'll fund off our preliminary estimates at the front end. And as you do your site fund release or a construction, we'll true those up to your actuals or your appraisals. And Brian will walk through those grants and calculations a little bit later. And then lastly, for my portion as part of your applications, so again, new application form, the 7001, we'll rely on self-certifications. Uh, a lot of dates we'll be collecting in all your declarations. Uh, you'll be submitting a copy of your site map, uh, enrollment documentation, narratives explaining what your product's doing. Uh, if you desire financial hardship, you'll submit those requests at that particular time. Um, the, we're gonna go with right now, tentatively the form 7002, your fund release authorization next. So that's when you're requesting either site or construction fund releases. It'll ask for updated information for everything. If you have DSA updated dates, approval dates at that point, site approvals from CD, you'll fill that all in at the same time. And then lastly, your most likely your 7003, which is your expenditure report, which we'll talk about most likely in a future stakeholder meeting. That's it. All right, thanks, uh, Brian Lapasco, PSC. So I want to talk about how we're going to calculate the grant. Um, it's going to be uh, very similar to SFP new construction and modernization criteria. So I don't think it'll be anything that you're unfamiliar with. Um, we're going to be using the um, the SFP K through six grant for both new construction and modernization, since these are kindergarten classrooms. Uh, so those will be the base grant amount, and we're going to be loading the classrooms at 25 pupils. So. Um, at the bottom of page seven, you'll see a very simple example of just what the base grant would look like. Um, and it's, this, these are both for uh, two classroom projects. So we're talking about 50 pupil grants. Um, just for the base grant, it comes in a little uh, under 600,000 for new construction, a little over 220,000 for modernization. That's again with no supplemental grant. So flipping over to the next page, um, the supplemental grants are a little bit different for full day kindergarten projects. Uh, the statute is pretty specific about which ones are included and not included. So the chart at the top of page eight will show you what is included. Um, for retrofit projects, uh, fire alarm and project assistant grants are available. And then for new construction projects, we have um, site, site development. That includes um, all four sections of site development. So uh, service site, utilities, offsite, and general site. Um, site acquisition, that, that includes the 2% other uh, the DTSC cleanup, hazardous waste, all that. Um, and then we have fire alarm and sprinkler, project assistance, and actually multi-level. Um, we didn't know that kindergarten classrooms could be multi-level, but uh, we, we talked to CDE about that, and it turns out that they actually can. Um, they have to have a dedicated staircase, I believe. Um, so if there are projects out there that are building multi-level um, and they meet the Title V requirements, then we'll be able to fund that too. Um, so kind of going through each one of those, um, we, we didn't want to require uh, site development worksheets for um, new construction projects. And so we went back and we looked at all the projects we funded under the SFP, new construction projects that had site development in them. Um, so we, you know, we didn't include design projects and uh, projects that didn't request site development. And it turned out that the average was about 35% of those projects was site development. So we're going to just be giving an allotment of 35% uh, for site development. And then um, for retrofit projects that have 50-year-old buildings uh, that are going to need utility upgrades, we're going to uh, similarly 
uh, include a 15% increase for those. Um, we did a similar study uh, for modernization projects with, uh, with those costs, and it actually came out a little lower than 15%, but we rounded up to 15. Um, site acquisition costs, uh, as Michael stated, uh, the project, the proposed site for the project must be adjacent to the existing site. Um, we're gonna be prorating the site acquisition cost um, commensurate with the classroom that you're providing or the classrooms that you're providing. So um, we'll, we'll kind of take a look at that and exactly what you need for those classrooms and we'll, we'll give you the site acquisition that's commensurate with those classrooms. Um, it'll be based on actual cost. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more, but basically um, just like SFP. So if you know the cost of the site, uh, it'll be the lesser of the appraised or the actual cost of the site you're, you're buying. Um, you get the 2% or 25,000 uh, minimum for site other and then um, DTSC and hazardous waste removal costs, which will be actual costs. Um, if you have not, so I'm moving to page nine now. Um, if, you, if you don't have uh, the site, the final site approval from CDE or you're not, um, you're not into escrow, um, we'll, we'll base the price off of uh, preliminary appraisal. Again, very similar to the SFP, uh, and you still will qualify for the 2% the and the DTSC costs. Um, and as Michael stated earlier, uh, we'll estimate those at the beginning, and then we'll chew them up once we, once we have uh, actual cost for those things. Um, Multi-level construction, again, we don't anticipate this will be the case, but it is available. Uh, and then at the center of uh, page nine there, there's some um, a little bit more developed examples of what a project might look like. Um, it's the same example as before, two classrooms for each type of, of um, of project, either a new construction uh, or a retrofit. And uh, so there's some examples there. You can see that we added in the 35% for site development for new construction, uh, fire alarm and sprinkler and project assistance. And uh, then for the retrofit project, we added in fire alarm and project assistance. We think those would be the most typical types of grants that we'll see requested. Um, so as I stated a minute ago, um, the, the statute's pretty clear on what is and isn't included uh, as far as supplemental grants. So a few of the grants that you won't see uh, are 50-year-old building pupil grants. Uh, I think I just talked about the utilities associated with 50-year-old buildings that are allowable, but not the actual increase per pupil grant amount. Uh, we don't anticipate there needing to be eminent domain, um, so there's no relocation costs. And then um, no new school grant, because again, this isn't uh, for growth, it's to uh, house existing pupils. And then um, also uh, urban security, small size project, geographic percent, percent factor increase in the accessibility fire code grants are not provided for in uh, education code. So once we accept these projects, um, if, if, uh, if and when we are oversubscribed for a given round, um, we wanted to make sure that we had a way to prioritize the project. So we're gonna introduce priority points. I'm skipping over now to page 10, sorry. Um, there'll be a maximum of 80 priority points available for a project, uh, and it's kind of in two categories. So the first category is if the district either um, fully or partially um, qualifies for financial hardship. So financial hardship is yes or no, but even if they don't have uh, even if they have some match, they still get a financial hardship approval. They get the 40 points associated with that. So that's, for, that's half of them right there. The other half will be uh, a sliding scale based on um, underserved communities, which, which really translates to mean percentage of kids on free and reduced lunch. So um, we, have a, we have a sliding scale chart that begins on page 10 and carries over to page 11. It starts at 60%. Um, so if 60% of your pupils are on free and reduced lunch, uh, that, that gives you four points right away and it goes all the way up to 100%, which would get you 40 points. So there's a total possible um, priority points of 80, uh, 40 being uh, financial hardship, 40 associated with the underserved community, the, the underserved communities on the sliding scale. So we think that'll separate it out pretty well. Um, depending on how our discussion goes today and uh, kind of the way you know this program starts to evolve, uh, we're anticipating that we might need to bring forward tiebreakers. We don't have any uh, proposals for that today, but uh, we, we anticipate bringing that back at a future meeting uh, if we need it. Um, if we think we need it, we will. We, we probably will. Uh, we'll come up with something. Um, we've, been, we've had some experience with that recently, so uh, we'll, we'll put that to good use. Uh, as far as fund releases, um, if, if we're talking about just a design grant or the 2% site other grant, those will be automatically released. As Michael said, this money is coming from the general fund. 
so we have access to it immediately. We don't have to do unfunded approvals and go through the priority funding process. Um, for the design and 2% other, you do not need to submit a 7002, which will be the new fund release form for the program. They'll be released automatically to you. Uh, site grants, um, so site acquisition grants, those will be released uh, after an apportionment's made and upon receipt of um, the uh, grant agreement uh, for the site acquisition portion of the project and um, a form 50 or a form uh, 7002, uh, the new fund release form. And then finally, for the full adjusted grants, uh, it'll be after the apportionment. Uh, we need the 7002. Um, you'll be making a certification that the matching share has been deposited or has already been expended by the district. And then we'll also need an executed grant agreement. Um, the, the, uh, as Michael alluded to a little bit, um, the, the 7002 can, um, will be filled out once you have basically the entire project under contract. So um, I, don't, I don't believe we're looking at dollar amounts so much as the, the scope of the project needs to be under contract when you send that in. And then, again, this is an effort to keep the money moving. It's a, it's a short window we have to get the money out, so we want to make sure that it's, it's moving. Um, and then um, we're going we're gonna to allow reservations of funds. Uh, so you can, you can apply without having DSA-approved plans. Um, and you, you have one year, just like the Career Tech Program, you have one year from when you're approved uh, to come in with your approvals and basically convert the project to a, to a full project with full approvals. Um, if your design funds uh, are not released separately, so if you come in for a design grant but you don't get a chance to request them before your full grant, they'll be released all at one time. And then um, for projects that come in that do have DSA approved plans, uh, you're gonna have 180 days in which to, to request your funds. Uh, it's a little bit longer than the priority funding process, which is 90, um, but we thought uh, six months would be good and that'll, that'll keep the money moving as well. Uh, we, we do intend on providing a list of eligible and ineligible expenditures. We don't have that yet. Uh, we're, we're, we're developing that. And so that'll be discussed at a future meeting. And then lastly, um, the audits will be local audits um, as with all Prop 51 projects now. And um, those will be uh, just the way the new SFP projects are, are done. So you'll have to hire a local auditor and do it that way. So with that, I think um, we've got through the item. Uh, we'd like to open up for questions and discussion on anything you'd like to talk about. And um, Lisa, uh, will, will, if you have a question, just raise your hand and she'll bring you a microphone. And we'll do our best to make sure that everybody watching can hear what you're, what you're asking. And um, we look forward to your feedback. Anybody have any questions or comments? Thank you. Can you hear me? You can. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Jeremy Kogan from Santa Ana Unified School District. Uh, first of all, thank you for having the stakeholder workshop today. Um, I think uh, you've answered a, quite a few questions just from your presentation. Uh, but a couple comments, I think, from a practical standpoint of um, working with uh, district facilities to make these modifications. One would be kindergarten playgrounds. Um, I think you pointed out that site development was a supplemental grant under new construction. But what I foresee happening is in a lot of cases, you have existing classrooms that weren't built uh, for kindergarten. And typically in a kindergarten program, you're running an adjacent uh, outdoor play area with age-appropriate play structures and, and materials. Uh, so for a school district to convert, let's say, a, a third grade classroom into a kindergarten classroom, uh, it's not just what happens inside that classroom space, but it's the surrounding kindergarten uh, play area as well uh, that a district would need to um, uh, have as part of its, its expenditure. Uh, so definitely would like to see if that uh, item could be addressed. Another item, uh, sort of similar to that, other secondary effects uh, are things like uh, kindergarten restrooms, which I assume would be part of this, uh, as that's one of the, the main Title V items. Um, uh, parking and drop-off as well. Um, kindergarten um, uh, students are more often dropped off, or, I'm sorry, are more often walked to their classroom as opposed to just being dropped off at a school. So uh, I know this all too well as a parent of a kindergartner. You, you're more often um, uh, parking your car, walking to the classroom with your kindergartner and, and bringing them there, which as you're uh, converting uh, your half-day programs to a full-day kindergarten program, 
what you're really doing is doubling the demand for parking at those points in time because now you have all your parents coming at the same time instead of half and half, if that makes sense. So another, that's another sort of an example of something that even if it's an existing site, uh, there, are, there are those types of site development costs that we would anticipate uh, being incurred. One more example of that would be on food services. Uh, Santa Ana Unified is a very heavily free and reduced lunch uh, provider to its students. I think we're about 91%. And if you're in a half-day program, you're provided a meal before uh, the AM program and after the AM program, or before the PM program and after the PM program. If you're in a full-day program, you're actually provided three meals throughout the day. So that's an, an additional one meal provided. So other than just the marginal uh, increase in food service operations, you're also talking about a place to have those kids eat that meal, right? A place where they actually can, um, you know, whether it's in the classroom or a shade structure outside that they are, uh, they're having that meal at. But again, another type of factor that we wouldn't necessarily um, think about right off the bat, but if you're converting non-kindergarten spaces into a kindergarten space and providing that full day program, a district would need to provide that. Uh, so just those are a few secondary effects um, that I wanted to put out there for uh, your comment or possible um, ways that the program could address that. Uh, only other point was just to thank uh, the staff for recognizing that, um, and I believe you said this in your presentation, um, that these uh, uh, grants are independent of modernization or new construction eligibility. It wouldn't be um, tapping into that eligibility um, for the grants that, that's really separate and independent of that. I think that's a, a major important point for school districts because it's not always those, those same sites that qualify for modernization that have a need for the, the full day kindergarten uh, program facilities. So thank you uh, and appreciate any comments you have. Thank you, Jeremy. I don't think we considered any of the points, so I, we appreciate the really feedback. Really good feedback, thank you. Thank you. Um, you did remind me of something, though. I think I skipped over a point uh, that you remind me of. So for the full-day kindergarten, yes, you don't need any new construction eligibility to apply to the program. It's independent from that respect. You also don't need modernization eligibility for, under the SFP. You can come in separately. We do note that under SFP rules, that if you add a classroom to the campus, we would hit your LCP new construction eligibility for that. Um, if you have an established, we'll notate it, but you didn't need new construction eligibility to add that classroom, but we will deduct it if you add a classroom brand new for capacity. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're in the really early stages of developing this program, so we really need your comments, if you have any, please. Morning. <clears throat> Morning, guys. Uh, uh, Ian Padilla today, representing School Facility Manufacturers Association. And uh, I did read and I saw uh, or, and, and I heard your statement that uh, portables uh, don't apply for this or, or don't qualify for this. Can you explain that a little bit more? I'm just a little, uh, uh, is, is that prohibited in the program, existing law, board policy, where, just give me a little more detail on that. Uh, uh, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Michael's checking right now, but I believe that was part of the statute. Let's see if we can find that. Yeah, we can follow up. Kind of sure. Up. Sorry, Barbara Kampminer with OPSC. Sure One of the things that we noticed when looking through the legislation is that there were a lot of similarities in the allowed costs in new construction and modernization, but there were some distinct differences. And portables are specifically allowed in the SFP, and it was omitted in the kinder language, so it's almost a cut and paste of what's allowed in SFP, and that piece was lacking. So our That's understanding cool. is that that is why portables cannot be included in this program, because they were not allowed. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> and Ian, thank you.
Hello, Ken Reynolds with SchoolWorks. I've met with a couple of our school district clients already, and there were really two big questions that came up. One is, what is the date for which this is really implemented in terms of if a school district just built a new kindergarten classroom for full day purposes and just occupied this school year? Or what if they're occupying next school year? Um, you know, is there any retroactive opportunities for funding? And then the second question I've received is if they do certify they're gonna offer full day kindergarten, is there any language in those resolutions that states how long they have to remain full day? You know, what if we hit another recession or something like that? Those are the two concerns and questions I've seen so far. Um, from an occupancy standpoint, I don't think we've uh, looked at or made any thoughts on that process. Um, if it's like SFP, though, our initial thoughts would be that from that June 27th, uh, 2018 date, when it actually became a law, that most likely contracts signed before that date are pulled off. We haven't expressly drafted anything about that thought process yet. We'll consider it. Yeah. And then for how long? I don't think we've considered that either. Under the SFP, you come in to build a new classroom, you house your kids, but what you do from that day forward, SFP is, uh, allows, is permissive to whatever you do after that. From the state's perspective, they met their obligation, the students were housed. I think the same is most likely true with full day kindergarten. If you be funding for these full day kindergarten, you're allowed to run it. What happens after that, I don't know that um, there's anything in the statute. We'll take a look. I could find more information. Oh, sure. Oh, sorry, I missed the button. It when it's on. Yeah. Got to be some more questions. <clears throat> Hi, Chris DeLong with Hancock Park in DeLong. Uh, is there a more defined definition of the design requirements for kindergarten classrooms um, besides the current definition? I think we could work uh, with CDE on that um, to get a little bit more definitive information. We could bring that forward at the next meeting, but I think it would be according to what they would require uh, as part of a, an adequate kindergarten classroom, the components of a kindergarten classroom. We can, we can bring that forward in our next item, though. Chris, are you asking more than what's in the the code of regulations part for fourteen zero thirty? Oh, so if you have a classroom right now, so the idea is that you don't have a full day or a kindergarten a kindergarten classroom that you can run full day kindergarten classroom out of. If you have a full day kindergarten, it may not necessarily meet today's requirements of Title V, but at the time it was built, it, it was considered a kindergarten classroom. Those projects are not eligible. So we're gonna, I, our initial thought is we rely um, in working with CD and your narrative to say this district indicated this classroom was not kindergarten. Um, is that correct? And if not, then you would be eligible for the program. But we don't, we don't have a definition because, you know, it's just like code changes, they change year to year. But the thought was that if you're compliant at the time, then you're not eligible now. Lisa? Laura Preston. Uh, Laura Preston with the Association of California School Administrators. Um, this just more kind of a more of a technical question. Um, because charter schools aren't allowed to apply for these funds, can school districts be a pass through to build those um, all day play? I mean, all day uh, kindergarten classrooms in a charter school that's under the school districts. Uh, over purview? Have the school district apply on the charter's behalf? Yeah. I don't, 
we consider that. I don't think we've talked about that. It's something else we can check out, though. Go ahead again. Uh, one more item on the uh, priority points. Um, you mentioned the percentage of free and reduced uh, lunches. Is that based on a district average uh, total, or is that for the actual school where the building's being built? Uh, that was on a district total. Yeah, district wide. And is there any consideration for a particular school because perhaps a district situation is different than an individual school? Um, I think the statute's specific to the district, but we'll take a look. Yeah, I believe it is too. Okay. Jeremy? Thank you. Yeah, two ad additional considerations. Um, uh, first would be transitional kindergarten. Is there any equivalency or mention or um, application to transitional kindergarten programs uh, or programs, a TK program run out of a kindergarten classroom? Uh, second uh, consideration would be, um, I, I can think of an example of a school where you, uh, you're at capacity, uh, but what you do is you take, say, three standard classrooms and you convert those three classrooms into two kindergarten classrooms. So now you're down one classroom. And now you've got to go back and convert something that isn't a classroom, say an office space, uh, back into a classroom or, or into a classroom. So um, sort of that ripple effect, right? Now you've created your two kindergarten classrooms, but you still have that expense of converting uh, another space back into a classroom. So you're, you have an, a net zero change, right, to your classroom count. Uh, just want to see if there's any consideration for, again, that sort of secondary effect of uh, building those two kindergarten classrooms at an existing site. You're, you're talking about adjustments to your SFP eligibility to account for that? No, just just in terms of the expenditure for a project. Okay. Uh, if that would be, an, you know, something that would be an eligible expenditure. Um, so again, you've got three class, you, you have no, no available classrooms at all at the campus, but you take three classrooms and you convert it into two kinders from a square footage standpoint, that, that's usually what happens. Right. Uh, but now you've lost one classroom. So to get that classroom back, you take, you take a space that's not a classroom, like an office or something else, and you convert it into a classroom. Okay. So that's another expenditure um, that's sort of outside the four walls of kindergarten, but it's, it's probably going to be related to the project and just want to see if, that, if expenditures on that would be eligible. Okay. Bring that back to the list. Thank you. Hi, Derek Lennox from Capital Advisors Group. Um, I have a follow-up question on the portables question that Ian asked. Um, I understand the interpretive response. Can you speak directly to the microphone? Okay, is that, is that better? Okay, um, I heard Barbara's response about interpreting the statute in that um, the full-day kindergarten program uh, does not specifically allow for portables. Um, but in that omission, I'm guessing that as an agency, you could interpret it one way or another to be an eligible expense or not. Is there a policy reason for not allowing the portables, um, or is it, you know, just your interpretation of the statute is, I guess, uh, what I'm asking. Thanks. Certainly. One other item I don't think is you've gotten to yet is what about in the case where there's project savings or you know if, you, if the expenditures are less than the budget. Right. Um, in, in theory, that would be possible, um, especially if you're building a new classroom. That one will bring back. We haven't talked about that one yet. And does the no portables also uh, include modular construction? I think those are viewed as separate. I, I thought so. Yeah. Is 
Keep them coming. The more the better. It's your opportunity. We do have another workshop coming up um, down in Van Nuys on, I believe, the 13th of September uh, in the morning. Uh, that one's at 9 a.m. We'll be webcast, yes. yes. Yeah, we'll bring back uh, the comments, address any questions you had from this meeting. We'll try to bring back and address, make sure we address all those at a future one. Hopefully, if we get there, maybe have a little more of a draft regulation, what it might look like. Lay that out, what the forms might look like. Um, we'll see what we can get, get done by then. Uh, Jessica. Uh, Jessica Love with Hancock Park and DeLong. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on the proration for the site acquisition, how that would work. So basically, we wanted to make sure that the site acquisition funds that we're providing uh, would, would only be to serve that new classroom. We don't, we don't uh, want to, well, I don't think the statute's intended to, to purchase a larger site for you know, some other projects further down the line or extra land you don't need for that project. So um, I, I, maybe we could come up with an example uh, for, our, for our second meeting. A little more specific example showing how we would do that proration, like with some specific acreage amounts and so forth. But we basically just want to make sure that the site acquisition funds we are providing are for the project and not for anything else. Right, because there's no, it's not intended for expanding the actual capacity. Right, exactly. So there's that's no. Why I was wondering how that was going to be calculated. Yeah, we um, we can we can bring an example back uh, so we can show exactly what we envision. Right, See thanks. how everybody thinks about that. Anything else? Well, like we mentioned, we'll bring back a follow-up item. Uh, we'll, bring, uh, we'll take all your questions, concerns into account. We'll see what we can do about those, or at least make sure we address them at our, at our next meeting. Um, ideally, we'll index that. If we're targeting the 13th, it'll have to be indexed most likely this week. Um, so if you're on OPSC's email subscription list, stay tuned for that one coming out. Um, We'll work on the item as much as we can get done before that time. Uh, like Brian had mentioned, we're thinking Van Nuys State Building from 9 to 12 on the 13th. Um, if you have questions you didn't think of today, email me and Brian. Yeah. Uh, we will pass along to our team and continue to work on it for the next couple of weeks. And that's about it. Huh? Michael, yeah. do you have a Uh, I don't think we have a hard deadline for when questions. We'll continue to work on this for the next meeting. We think we might need a third meeting for some cleanup. Um, any last minute addresses before we actually go to the board, so there will be an opportunity. I would just say get them as soon as possible so that- I have time to evaluate it. Right, for the, yeah. for the 13th. All right. Oh, we don't have a date yet. Yeah. Last right. chance, any other questions? Thank you all for coming. Um, we really appreciate your attendance and your interest. And uh, we look forward to seeing, hopefully, some of you and uh, some new faces as well on the 13th. It's exciting to have a new program. So thank you very much. Thank you.